What's up? So for today's video, I'm going to talk about the internet for my memoir series playlist. And uh, I already did a video about reading and I don't know how, I can't remember how well I articulated um, how, you know, libraries, right? Libraries of books shaped my perspective of how to share ideas, of how ideas are situated, right? So when I was a child, I had books in my home in uh, bookshelves right my parents books mostly and then my own and we had shelves all around the house we had shelves uh in along the house just everywhere there were, there were shelves i mean okay i'm making it sound a bit more dramatic than it is but there were there were books there were shelves of books right and i came to appreciate each book on the shelf each book on each shelf as a portal into a different universe a portal into learning things a portal into understanding things you know it's it's each each sentence each paragraph in a book is a, a set of ordered symbols that allow you to reconstruct what it is that the author wanted to tell you and then you interpret it in your head you hallucinate the details or you know you imagine whatever it is that you're supposed to be imagining and what's not you know it's kind of weird to discuss this in along in that sense in that it's a skill it's a skill you can develop it's not entirely kind of a natural if you think about it it's it's like literacy i'm talking about literacy the art of interpreting symbols and extracting meaning from the symbols you know for probably the vast majority of human history there wasn't writing there wasn't symbols people just spoke and they relied on body language and facial expression and and words right and who knows how recent words are like utterances i mean there are people who study these things but i don't know off the top of my head when our ancestors started speaking in sentences Right and uh, how much of communication was non-verbal before that, and the act of communication through writing down a list of symbols is a kind of you know I want to say arcane act. It's a kind of magic. It's a kind of uh, art that is it's a symbolic thing. Like we just because we start reading so early, those of us who do, I'm, which I'm guessing is most of us, right? Um, it we kind of take it for granted that we can read and write but you know it's a it's a it's a skill set like you can kind of imagine imagine a fantasy novel where like there's a guild of people who read and write and most people don't and i i'm pretty sure that is still kind of true in some parts of the developing world where you know most people in a village or something are, are laborers and they don't know how to read and write. I mean, okay, again, I, I, again, I don't know the specifics of the details as well, but I, I feel like it's unlikely that it would not be the case, right? And and these people kind of, they depend on the scholars or the learned people in their villages who are educated. And when I say educated, I don't mean, you know, wise. I mean, like, schooled, right? Schooled men like and women. But, you know, for most of human history, men, right? people who can do bureau do bureaucracy on their behalf and to this day we have you know we have lawyers right we have software engineers we have people who whose job is to process symbols right and and like legalese like it's written in english or whatever language your country is uses and uh, but it has to be interpreted by a specialist right and for for a long period of time that was the case for you know, holy texts, right? You needed priests or whoever to be your intermediaries to tell you in words with their mouths what the scripture said, right? So we have come, we have come a long way from that and I, I almost feel like there's, there's a kind of missing history there where we don't entirely appreciate. And you know, a lot of, I think a lot of people in the world, they use, they don't text each other, they use voice messaging, which is not super intuitive to the people who were born and raised on books and then on text messaging and emails and stuff like that but like there are people who do voice comms with their phones with whatsapp and whatnot and it's just interesting to think about 
and um, yeah, so uh, I, five minutes in, and I, this is going to be a video about the internet, but I wanted to start by talking about libraries and books and symbols, because when I first encountered the internet, I was about maybe seven or eight years old, uh, I went, and, and again, it's interesting to think about how my nephews and niece, who are, you know, who I've watched them grow from infancy to five, six, seven, eight, you know, my oldest nephew is now 14, I think, my niece is about seven, and, and uh, my younger nephew is about 11 or 10, right? And they have encountered an internet, and I don't even know if they say the word internet, I've not I have to reflect on it and I have to talk to them more but you know they think of it as like is the Wi-Fi on and like uh, they, they they interact with mobile devices primarily so you know like in my when I encountered the internet it was on a computer right and it was primarily text that I was interacting with hypertext I'll get into the details in a bit but like uh, there has been a shift I think in the way new young people and digital natives interface with uh, technology interfaced with the internet and it's it's become more video first and audio first I guess and and just the the act of transcribing anything into text is we may have crossed peak text in a certain sense it's possible just we won't, I'm not sure if that's true uh, I hope it's not true and I would like to see, you know, a text renaissance. And I think there will always be people who love poetry, people who love, you know, the visual art of ordered symbols. But, you know, TikTok and Instagram are examples of how, like, an image-first uh, communication is It's almost more natural, more organic, more a thing right? and yeah I mean like I'm, I, I do I haven't been writing like long blog posts in a while I will get back to it at some point I think but I feel like there's this whole spectrum of communication that is better done on video because you get to see me hesitate you get to see me go well hmm, you know like you get to see all of that that doesn't come through in text very well unless you deliberately insert it yourself and um that's just going to be interesting to play out. But okay, back to my story. I was about seven or eight. Uh, I was enjoying video games. I, I enjoyed books and I enjoyed video games. And um, when I encountered the internet, one of the first things I enjoyed was just playing online games. I, rem I vaguely recall like Flash games, I think. That was one thing that I liked about it. But the other big thing that blew my mind was discovering communities people online who played the same video game that I played. And, you know, this is a story that I tell in my book, Friendly Ambitious Nerd, about how I used to play this game called Darkstone, which was sort of like a Diablo 1.5. It was never really very famous. It was made by a small, I think, French studio called Delphine Software that doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, none of my, ga none of my friends in real life played that game. And here was a forum of other people who played that game. And so I, I felt a bond with these internet strangers who I could correspond with, right? I could have conversations with them about the game that I liked and they also liked it. I don't know who they were. I didn't know their names and faces and whatnot. But just, you know, it's like a BB, BB forum, I think. But just having that opportunity to exchange thoughts and ideas with people, I found it very compelling and I wanted more and more of that. And I got involved in... Like uh, the game FAQs forum, you know, I was playing geek multiplayer online games. Like uh, I was playing Neopets at some point. I was playing these Swerve dot com games like Earth twenty twenty five and uh, Utopia. I still get emails from Utopia saying that there's a new season every few months or whatever. Uh, what else? There were websites, you know. I remember Maddox. Uh, I remember StickDev dot com, which had like these um, Flash videos basically videos made in flash that were like elaborate kind of sick <laughs> on retrospect elaborate like uh, scenarios where stick figures would kill each other in like an action movie kind of in setting and uh i just loved all of it and i and and it's interesting to look back and see how much i was drawn to this universe even though I don't know, like, I guess my family and, and, and my real life friends didn't seem to care about it as much. Like when I was tw like 
10, 11, 12, I was one of the IT club guys. You know, I was one of the guys who was interested in HTML and I was interested in uh, just computers, working with computers. I was, cu- I was robotics curious, but I didn't get super into that. Uh, I was programming curious, but I didn't get super into that either. I think it's interesting. I guess I've always been very content first. Like, uh, so when I made my own, my first personal website my homepage I had like a guest book and everything I kind of treated it as like a digital uh, like a home like a like a place that I could invite friends to to check out check out my homepage you know check out my house my house on the internet and uh, it had links to my favorite games I would copy paste my favorite jokes right I have a jokes page I think Uh, I had like gifs from my favorite video games that I would save I remember at some point I think I had like a floppy disk I would have multiple floppy disks that I would save my favorite images on because back then there was there weren't like Google image search and stuff, right? So when you find a nice image, you save it because you you don't know when you're gonna find how you're gonna find it again. And yeah, I would I would I would bring floppy disks to school. I don't know why I did that. Uh, yeah, and and like uh, you could download these very small games. I remember like Galaga, like a, or like a Galaga clone, like a Space Invaders kind of game. Uh, I thought that was super cool that you could go on the internet, you could right click something and save as or whatever, and it starts downloading. And then, back then it was like ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and then it's and then you can start playing a game that's on your computer that was from the internet, and that was like that blew my mind. Uh, what else? I remember downloading. Uh, at, when I was in secondary school, I had a senior who was had a very cool like taste in music and stuff he introduced me to radiohead and and uh well it was my teacher who introduced me to radiohead but he was like my senior and he seemed kind of cool and then uh i think he was the one who introduced me to was it called soul seek it was a, like kaza i guess it was like a p2p downloading thing and i was getting very into music i have a video about that uh and i remember downloading radiohead's concert at glastonbury 2003 i think and it took me like days and days to download. It might have been weeks to download uh, a video file that was about an hour plus long. Um, I don't think it was more than a c- several hundred megabytes. I don't know how many megabytes. I, it was definitely less than one gigabyte because my computer didn't have that much space. My It was like a Pentium 2, I think, that I downloaded it on. God. And uh, when I finally got to play the video, it was like an event for me. And I was so, so happy. And it's still one of my favorite uh, concert footages. And I think like that you can find it on youtube now and just you know and when i first encountered streaming i think i encountered like google video before i encountered youtube or something like that i i i signed up for a youtube account very early on i signed up for one in like 2005 if you check out my youtube account so my youtube username is visa v-i-s-a because like you know youtube was so small then that like corporate companies and stuff didn't care about it yet and I have this whole side plot drama that I'll maybe one day talk about, about how Visa tried to get my YouTube channel from me. It's a funny story. Um, but yeah, my YouTube username is still Visa. That's a fun uh, fact, right? You can look it up. If you go to youtube.com slash u slash Visa, it's my account. And if you want to check out youtube.com slash Visa, it redirects to u slash Visa brand. Hmm? <laughs> um, but more about the internet and more about my relationship with it. You know, um, I, when I was in sec- pri- primary school, when I was about uh, 12, 12-ish, uh, my classmates had blogs. I don't know who was the first person who started blogging, but people were using Blogspot, uh, Diaryland, DiaryX, uh, Zanga. Is that what it's called? Zanga? Live Journal. And it was just, it was like Facebook before Facebook. You know, we didn't have Facebook yet. And so we kind of just wrote about our lives every day, every other day or so. And we would check on each other's blogs and we would see what our friends wrote about us and we would leave comments on each other's blogs. And it was just this this kind of digital texting social life. Before texting, we didn't have smartphones then. So we had regular, we had like older phones that could do texts. And at the time, like you had, it cost money to text, right? And um, yeah, I remember my primary school teacher from primary five her name was mrs sin and she was moving to the states and um we liked her a lot and we missed her and uh, we so we were all on msn messenger at the time and i think msn messenger is no longer 
it's like they shut it down at some point last year or last last year and you know we would all kind of chat on msn messenger all the time uh, i would chat with the girl who became my girlfriend who is now my wife on msn messenger uh, we I mean we met in school but we would not have stayed in touch if not for msn messenger so that's one way that the internet shaped my life right if not for mes- msn messenger i would not be married to my wife isn't that pretty crazy and then, but there's more where that came from uh soon uh, but yeah, and I, I think like once a month or something like that, we would have a group chat on MSN where Mrs. Sin would be online at some, I think early on her end and kind of like maybe 8 p.m. on our end or something like that. And it was cool. It was cool to be able to talk with my friends in real time over the internet. And that just felt, it felt like connectivity, right? It felt, and I remember at that time, my parents were like, why are you always on the computer? You know, why aren't you either studying or you know exercising or you know doing something with your life right doing something proper right i now make a living entirely on the internet in a sense you know if not for the internet i don't know what i would be doing with my life right i i but i let me get back to things i was so i had a blog i was blogging a lot uh, why was I blogging so much? I, just, I it was my form of self expression, I guess. I was again, I, I used to read a lot, and I was kind of a literary kid, and so I enjoy just using text to connect with people, and I enjoy checking on all the forums every day to see what people were saying, and and you know, getting reputation points, and and uh, at some point I got on the typology central forums, which is like an MBTI forum, and I socialized there for a couple of years. I would socialize on the Singapore Gamers social board. It's like an offshoot of Game FAQs. And uh, yeah, it was just, I had this whole digital web of friends. And, and you know, I've lost touch with a lot of those people, which is kind of sad because we just never, you know, like whatever relationship we had in whatever domain, it just felt kind of okay. Like, it, I guess we didn't consider at the point of time when we were talking with each other that those relationships might one day kind of drift apart, right? So if we had known, I think we would have made more more of an effort. Uh, But once in a while, I do get people who find me on Twitter or elsewhere on the internet, and they're like, hey, Visa, is this Visa from, you know, so-and-so forum? I'm so-and-so. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So you can kind of, you know, sometimes connect with old friends, which is cool. But uh, what else? Forums, blogs, games... Uh, mostly that stuff I remember uh, I did see some terrible shit on the internet uh, as a like an edgy young teenager I think at about 14 or 13 14, 15 you know you discover pornography and you discover I don't I actually don't think that pornography was as crazy as like the real crazy shit which is like gore and you know violence and like seeing like I I was like 14 or 15 years old when I was looking up pictures of like, oh my God, like really horrific shit. Like I saw that stuff and you know, I I, I can't claim to speak on behalf of everybody, but you know, but like for me, it was very real. You know, it was very like I understood that what I was looking at was grotesque. You know, I, I knew that images of like you know people who had been killed in 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 all those things uh was like you you just know that's that's, it it feels i want to say unholy it feels it feels wrong sometimes when you see you see a photo of of a dead person like like and the photo is up in their face or whatever and there's just a sense of i shouldn't be looking at this you know like like you know it's like um it's not for me i guess kind of and uh you know, even when I saw, I was recently watching a documentary about uh, Malcolm X, and there are photos of just there, there. There's some social, implicit social rules about what is acceptable and not acceptable to see, what's polite and impolite, what's all those things. And there are avenues in which you can kind of um, cross boundaries. And I guess at a meta level, it's understood that you can cross those boundaries. Uh, but like you know and then you know that you shouldn't be sharing those things with regular people without context right or at least I felt that way and I know that there are people who don't feel that way which is 
it's just interesting. It's interesting. Like, and as I'm saying these things, I'm thinking about how much the internet facilitated my understanding of social reality, right? Like, uh, so I live in Singapore, which is a small island city state, but the internet felt very Western, very American, very, uh, and some Europeans, I guess, like a British or whatever. But it, it, I guess it's mostly very American, right? I, I was getting clued into American culture through, I mean, I did watch like MTV on television, right? So that was my first entry point to, well, I guess it was happening around the same time. Like, uh, but yeah, I was looking up, you know, music and 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 videos and and stuff like that. And it's a very choose your own adventure kind of thing, right? And uh, but and, you know, I, like I saw that I looked up the things that I was curious about, but I didn't. It's not like I I became obsessed with it. It's just you know I wanted to know. I saw it. I I got a sense of it, and then yeah, I move on with my life and and uh try to find other things to do i guess uh when i discovered music that became a big thing for me and i wanted to play in a band and i wanted to, so when I, I formed a couple of bands that didn't work out and then when i finally found formed a band that i really liked armchair critic you can look up my youtube channel for that if you want like i said it's armchair critic tv and uh you know i had a band set up a myspace page and used it to kind of a uh, chat with music fans from all over the world that was really fun you know I, I felt like I learned I learned a lot about marketing I learned about just how to talk with people I do think that I developed a lot of my communication skills in forum exchanges right in in replying to people in imitating you know good replies and 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 learning from other people through imitation so like the amount of time I've spent on internet forums is kind of crazy you know it, it was my dominant thing and I, I always want to know like what do people spend their time on you know like like so when I was spending all my time on the internet you know reading forums and posting on forums and you know learning to accumulate social status on forums what was everyone else doing what were you doing let me tell me what you were doing when you had you know when you're done with school and you had time to spare I guess you know so I know that some people play music right like some like I remember when I was a teenage when I was like 15 or so and I had friends who could play the piano really well I'm like how do you know how to do that and it's, it's just you know they have a regular music lessons every week for years and years and you know I guess the internet was my thing that I spent all that time on so when people ask me kind of like how do you do it you know it's like I want to say it's not very difficult but for me it did take a lot of trial and error and a lot of Error, error right and i was very persistent i was, was very i just wanted to do it i um and uh i guess it felt so limitless that was the other thing like it was truly it it, it felt like a massive library right and every time i go to the library as a kid i would fucking run around and, and collect as many books as i could carry to bring to, to borrow and bring home right and the internet was like an infinite library right and uh i was eager to well, I don't know when exactly I developed kind of a, a sense of I can really build something big. You know, I, I guess it was it's probably when I became a musician and I wanted to be a rock star. And, you know, for me, the phrase rock star is is it's a lot of things, right? It's about having influence, having being creative and producing creative output, writing songs that people enjoy. Right. And so, now, you know, even now when I'm making these videos, in a sense, each video is like a song in a sense right and yeah i just want to share stuff with people i want to find my people and i and you know i, I tweeted about this earlier this morning which is kind of like i've always been a bit of a misfit in life like even within my family i'm kind of a weird guy in my country i'm kind of a weird guy everywhere i go i'm kind of a weird guy i'm the th i'm taller i'm browner you know i i talk about different things i'm just i'm just a bit weird and strange and the internet has always been a very accepting place for weird and strange or at least it was as far as i remember when i was growing up on it some people say that oh you know now we have like facebook and instagram and and tiktok stars and everyone's kind of conventionally attractive and and doing all these uh very kind of stereotypically mainstream aesthetics like you know like cars and, and butt photos and whatever but like while that is kind of the city center there's still infinite periphery where we can do everything and this is what i'm doing right i've i've been, 
I have a thousand plus subscribers on YouTube. I'm sure like half of them were from the like early days and they're not even active on YouTube anymore. But let's say I have 500 plus subscribers who, you know, okay, each time I make a video in recent times, every video gets about, about 100 views, right? So I'm making these videos that are like an hour long, 45 minutes long for a couple of dozen people. Why? Because I can, you know, because I, I, I want to meet people. I want, and you know, like um, the people that I meet in real life have not been scratching the itch for me. Like in mainstream Singaporean society, when I was growing up, like my friends at school and my friends of family or my extended relatives, like everyone was so normal. I don't fault them for being normal, but I'm not. And I have come to terms with that about myself. And I just want to find the others, right? And the internet is the single best way I can conduct that search. And so from the time I was, let's say, 15 until now I'm 30, right? Well, I'm 30. <laughs> I have been conducting that search. And I have been on, you know, I did it on Reddit. I did it on Quora. I did it on my blog. I did it on Facebook even. I did it on, I'm doing it on Twitter. Now I'm doing it on YouTube. I'm just looking for other weirdos like me. And, you know, I believe that they are out there because statistically they have to be, right? And uh, when I find them, each time I find one of them, I feel a real affinity for them. You know, I, I could use language like a soul connection or whatever. But it's just, we, we read this, we read, we all read books as kids, right? Um, in my thread today, I said that because I read so much as a kid, I, my, my operating system was different. The, the, the map of reality that I operated with was different. My sense of time is different. My sense of what is a meaningful life is different. And just everything about me is, is so different that, you know, for me to find companionship is really, is really a stretch. And, you know, like uh, I was saying things like, you know, that I have all these things I can cite in my, in my research. There are all these people throughout time who are like me and who struggled to find peers and, and, and they didn't have the internet, right? And so they, what they would do is they would try and go to, go to monasteries or go to universities or go to just where, wherever the action was, right? I guess you would go to a major city, right? And then you would look up, whatever interesting things were happening in the major cities and you try to find your your people and on retrospect i'm i'm uh, kind of ashamed slash embarrassed that it took me like a very very long time to travel in search of people like i and i think you know to not be too harsh on myself i think at some level i was nervous about travel because my experiences traveling with my family was not very pleasant and you know i'm like a brown guy who's probably going to get stopped at airport security like it's just i wasn't i didn't feel comfortable and i didn't realize that i was feeling uncomfortable about the idea of travel um and also you know i was kind of a spoiled privileged kid who who's like mom and like would, would take care of everything and like i didn't but you know, i didn't know how to cook i didn't know how to do my laundry that that stuff kind of got sorted out like uh when i went to the military and stuff but like just I it was a kind of discomfort that I didn't feel ready to address until I was like in my late twenties, like after I got married and, and stuff like that. And uh yeah man, uh the internet has been my way of traveling. It has been my way of exploring the world, exploring other people's minds. And I have I still have so much more to say about this and we are half an hour in. Right? Uh what else do I wanna say? Um so I, I, I have a blog, I was blogging, uh, I used to blog about my personal life mostly and because most of my friends who knew me online were, I mean the people who were like following my, my Twitter back in the day or my Facebook or my live journal, they were all basically my, like 90% of them were my online, my real life friends or friends of friends in Singapore. And so I never set out to make Singaporean content, but I was just making content about what I cared about and what I thought about and that was kind of intrinsically Singapore-ish, right? And uh, at some point, I discovered a live journal community on Singapore called like SG underscore LJRS, like Singapore Live Journalists. And I was like, oh, cool, a community of Singapore people. Let's post something Singapore-ish. And so I wrote a blog post. I was like 16 or 15. I wrote a blog post called Singapore, the good, the bad, the ugly, something like that. And I was like, oh, you know, hey, everyone, like Singapore is 
Like I, I'm, I'm proud to be Singaporean and and uh, and everything's so clean and, and efficient and good. But you know, can't we be nicer to each other? Why are we so mean to each other? Why are we so obsessed with making money and and pursuing wealth? And we, when we know it doesn't give us like true fulfillment, and like you know, can we be kinder to each other? And can we support the arts? And and can we? I was like 15, and and all of those things I still care about and I still talk about, and I'm making videos about them right now. You know, I've been doing this for 15 years, and I will be. I imagine I'll be doing it for 50 more years, right? And I think it's worth doing. And anyway, when I made that, I got like 10 comments, which is like triple or quadruple the amount of comments I usually get. And so that that gave me a woof, it gave me a, a boost. I was like, oh shit, people care about what I just wrote. I want to write more. And then I, I started writing more and more about Singapore. At some point, um, I was radicalized by something I saw in the media, right? I saw a newspaper article about... Uh, PSLE scores. So PSLE is uh, primary school leaving examination or primary six. Primary school leaving examination is the exam you take at the end of primary school to decide what score you get so that which determines what secondary school you can go to, right? And uh, there was an article that said, oh, you know, the vast majority of, like more than half of, or so, close to half, like let's just say half, like half of top scoring Singaporean students are from public housing, which is like where most Singaporeans live. So 80, like 85% of Singaporeans live in public housing. I'm currently in a public house, right? HDB flat. Whereas like 10, like 15-ish, 14 to 15% of Singaporeans live in landed property. Those are wealthier people who can afford like a hundred, like a, you know, you can't really get landed property for less than a million dollars basically, right? And it can go all the way up to tens of millions I think there might be some that's like over 100 million and they were saying um, half of Singaporeans who do well in their exams are from public housing but that also means that half of Singaporeans who do well in the exams are from landed property wealthy wealthy homes so 14 like 15 14 15 percent of Singaporeans who are in the top the top strata of society wealth wise are 50 percent of the top scores Right, so that's that's inequality, right? And and I'm not saying you know, like I I don't even care about the implications of that that much. I was I was distraught that the facts were being presented in a way to imply the opposite of reality. Right, the reality is that these people are overrepresented. But the newspaper article is saying that oh, you know, the like eighty percent of people make up fifty like about half. You know, so. So we, you know, that which proves that uh, social mobility is is available. Uh, so I wrote in to the press about it, I, and uh, they published my feedback. But they made it, you know, I I in my feedback I wrote, you know, you're misleading the public. You know, your statistics are being presented in the wrong way. If you flip it the other way around, you can see that it says the opposite. And they kind of like like edited my criticism. They edited out the misleading part. Which is, you know, whatever. And then they kind of implied that I'm just saying, oh, you know, you look at it this way, but you can also look at it that way, right? But they, they, they deliberately kind of defanged my criticism that if somebody's just scanning the papers, they're not going to see it. And so I wrote a blog post about that. Like, what the fuck, Straits Times, <laughs> right? And that went moderately viral. And I'm like, oh, shit, you know, the state media, like, we can't quite trust the state media to give us the facts present us the facts in a way that is like sensible like they were presenting they were presenting it in a way that is meant to assuage people and make them feel better which is not a sustainable solution in the long run for an informed public right and so i started writing regularly about singaporean society and politics and news and i developed quite a readership and i got quite you know be, be, lots of comments i kind of felt Significant. I felt I felt like I was doing something important and of, of public interest and of relevance, but uh, I I kind of got swept up in that a little bit, and uh, I was actually invited to meet the prime minister in two thousand and ten, no two thousand and twelve, twenty twelve I think. Yeah, I was done with my military service so twenty twelve in like August or something, or earlier than that July. I don't know. I was already done with my military service and I went, uh, like my hair was pretty long back then and I went to meet the Prime Minister along with a bunch of other bloggers and it was kind of a, I was kind of starstruck by the, you know, oh, I'm just a lowly blogger and I'm being invited to meet the Prime Minister and then, and he is, to his credit, he is a very charming, kind, smart guy in person when he wants to be. 
And you know Like I wrote this whole Kind of You know Like many years later I look back on it I'm like Huh You know I was kind of You know It it, it was a su- Very successful Very well executed Kind of uh, PR campaign Without explicitly telling us To write nice things They didn't say what They didn't tell us What to do But like I, I genuinely at the time Felt obligated to You know I do feel a bit better Having met him Knowing that He's smart And thoughtful And seems to care About what he's doing uh, But you know In the years since uh, I've seen other news And whatever And I think And and contrasting that With, with other interactions I've had with Powerful people uh, I do think That there's a whole class Of powerful people Who can be very charming And very personable And likeable um, And they will also You know They can be all of that and there can also be legitimate criticism of their decisions and 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 all those things. So it's 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 uh it's complex, right? And yeah, you know, but yeah, so that made me really feel like uh like I was important kind of, and I, I kind of got a little bit carried away with that. And I was writing a lot, and uh, or there was some time I got a job. So my my boss, my ex boss. He found me and emailed me because of that blog post that I wrote about meeting the Prime Minister. And he said... And he liked my blog. He saw a few of my articles before that and he was like, oh, this is pretty thoughtful writing from some Singaporean guy. And uh, we met for coffee. At the time, I, he offered me a job and I actually turned him down the first time because I was committed to... I had just gotten married and I wanted to be a flight steward with Singapore Airlines so that I could write... Um, on my breaks Like I, my plan was I'm going to fly So I can see the world a bit And then like When I land I'm going to write As much as I can And then I fly again That was my plan But I didn't make it Past the first round Of uh, kind of selection So the, the To become a flight steward There's like multiple levels Of selection The first couple of layers Are very arbitrary So it, people who become Flight stewards And stewardesses They kind of Have to repeatedly go And um, Yeah that worked out So I, I was desperate For a job And I emailed him again I texted him Saying hey Uh can we start <laughs> Can we do this And he was like Yeah sure And then I ended up working for him For five and a half years And it was some of the best Times of my life Which I will probably Make a separate video about uh, But you know My job was to run The company blog um, The company was called Referral Candy It made a Referral pro- Referral marketing software For online stores And around that time I was also selling T-shirts with my Co-founder Desmond Who you know We were which we start, which is a business that we started on Facebook, right? So I posted a bunch of T-shirt ideas on Facebook, and people liked it, and they were asking me like, "How much? When can I buy it?" I'm like, "These are just ideas. I have no idea how to sell a T-shirt, how to make a T-shirt." But so I, I went to find out how do you make T-shirts and and how do you whatever, and I, I went through the whole process, and yeah, we ended up right having like a surprisingly, I wouldn't say super lucrative, like a, you know, it, we we made some money. It wasn't. Very profitable But It was fun It was interesting And it was like Cash positive So Like if you If you count the number of hours And stuff we put in Into the business It We weren't getting a lot of money out of it But We learned a lot We learned about marketing We learned It was a, it was a fantastic education Right And in terms of Uh you know, you can. Some people go to school to learn those things, and they don't develop those skills at all, and they paid for it, which is mm, you might as well. But that's just my experience, you know. Uh, anyway, t-shirt business, uh, and I ended up recruiting Desmond to work with me at Referral Candy, and he still works with Referral Candy after I've left, which is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I spent five and a half years managing the company blog. I learned a lot about marketing. I learned a lot about... Like, it was where I started using Twitter more heavily. Like, I had a Twitter account all along. But it was, you know, I'd tweet once in a while when I just wanted to get some shit off my head. And, like, hardly anybody read it. But when I was using it as a marketing guy for my software company that I was working at, uh, I would interact with lots of people as as the company. And then I'd put, like, dash V at the end, you know, to, to say that I'm a human. And uh, I had a lot of interesting responses from people. I had a, it, and the company is a very global, has clients from all over the world. So I was talking with people from all over the world. That also happened when I was on Quora. When I was on Quora, I was answering questions that were general, not just about Singapore. I mean, I also answered Singapore questions because I knew the answers to them. But like, uh, I developed, you know, Quora gave me like this badge in 20, 
2013, 2014, and 2015, I was a Quora top writer, and that just that boosted my ego substantially. It made me, I mean, and as in, it it gave me self confidence. It made me believe that I had something worth saying that an international audience would be interested in. So that that kind of altered my thinking a little bit. And I guess I was busy with work where I was writing a lot of marketing content. I still think that some of the content that I made at Referral Candy is some of the best content I've ever produced. And it's like, you know, I was like analyzing businesses and analyzing marketing campaigns. And I did it as as honestly and thoroughly as I could. Uh, some would say that, you know, it's almost irrational how much effort I put into my work. But... Um, you know, I I have a big picture, long view thing, on, long view perspective on things. So I, while I was kind of like white knuckling it a little bit too much back then, like I did the best I could as an early 20 year old. And um, the company got more than its money's worth, I would say, with the benefit of hindsight. I'm like, you know, they, they paid me, they paid me well, like better than I thought I could. You know, I don't have a university university degree, but I was being paid better than I dared to believe I was worth. And I'm really grateful that I didn't have to like negotiate for raises and stuff. Like my boss would just give it to me. I'll, I'll talk about that in a separate video. But um, yeah, I, I I learned a lot about marketing. I learned a lot about internet forums, marketing forums, business forums, uh, just people who ran who run e-commerce companies. Right? I was researching how people make money online, and uh, it just became very natural for me to to go to work and be on the computer all day and then i would be on my phone on the tra- commute to work and back and i'll be tweeting sometimes i'll be writing my word vomits for my my word vomit blog and uh yeah i was just very very online <laughs> and uh but you know those years after i left after i got my job they were quite lonely like uh you know so you know even in 2020 20, like so okay uh when i started work I I felt like I couldn't juggle work and my Singapore blogging and around at some point like you know um, I just started to feel like the blogosphere like the things were evolving right so Facebook became more prominent people were starting to write Facebook statuses and it's, there was a time where you couldn't share Facebook statuses it was just you know you have to copy paste the whole thing if you wanted to and nobody did that right uh, barely anybody did that and uh, so writing blog posts was a lucrative thing to do lucrative in terms of like attention and, and currency social currency but like uh, over time it became less and less necessary to write blog posts it's because people people would just write Facebook statuses and share those right? like directly and uh, <clears throat> I felt like I I was struggling to keep up with my workload at work and my local blogging about Singapore at the same time, which I would have tried to manage if not for the fact that I felt like my blogging wasn't making the same impact that I wanted to make. Like, so in the earlier days, I felt like I was performing a valuable public service by reporting on, you know, reporting, right? Citizen journalism. By reporting on what I felt were the shortcomings of the media. And it felt like nobody else was saying those things. Like, very, not many people were saying those things. Now it feels like there's always people saying these things, which is great. I, I love that there's this like decentralized network of, of like news media observers who are like questioning things and stuff. But so if that's happening, you know, I don't really need to be in the trenches doing it every single day. And also, uh, I just felt like I had been falling into this this cycle where I would try, so I would try to have standards. I would try, to, so I, I could see the path, you know, to, and like some people went the extreme and like, you know, there's this, there's this blog called The Real Singapore or whatever. And they were basically posting like very content that was optimized for outrage, right? And sometimes they would post like falsehoods and whatever. And it was just, you know, it's like rac- racial stuff and xenophobic stuff and like just stuff to get people mad. And they would get a ton of traffic and they would get a ton of ad revenue from the traffic. And they were eventually arrested for, I think for sedition or for like, like you know, like social undress or whatever. And uh, the founder of the blog, I think she went to jail for like six months or 10 months or something. And if I understand correctly, they made enough money from their blog that it paid for their house, which is like several hundred thousand dollars. And then they were, she went to jail for like, I don't know, like less than a year. And then she came out. And now they're like happily running, I think, a ramen shop 
And it's cute because you get to see that their Facebook page of the ramen shop has the same kind of like meme-ish marketing that they used to have on The Real Singapore. And I look at that and I think, huh, you know, I am like seven or eight years into paying my mortgage. I have, you know, my, my home costs several hundred thousand dollars and I've paid off barely a quarter of it, I think-ish, something like that. And you're telling me that if I did what they did, right, I would have to go to jail for less than a year, but then I wouldn't have to pay off my mortgage for another 20 years. That's that's actually quite compelling. Think about it. Like in terms of, you know, like, so, but, you know, at, at the cost of your soul in some in some sense, right? Like you, you post cursed content, like you summon a demon to post cursed content and you... You farm the, the, the money from that outrage and, and sowing social discord and whatnot. Right? You're making society worse by doing that. But you make enough money that you can pay for your house. And now there's like that saves you twenty years of life of, of like career grinding. Right? And you know, if you wanna be kind of grey area moralistic about this, you do that first. You go to jail. You know, in jail you yeah, read books, you know, work out, whatever, suffer for a year, compared to people suffering for decades and in wage slavery or in, you know, however you want to frame it. And then you come out and then you can kind of like, like, pursue a redemption arc because now you've paid off your mortgage. Like, that's that's like your your main financial challenge in life done. And now you have like all this free energy and headspace and you can start doing charity work. You can start doing, you know, whatever good things you want to do. And I bet like in like, five years of that stuff, you'll have successfully whitewashed your reputation, right? Is that not true? You know, sometimes so, so sometimes when I say things like, you know, like being able to think strategically over the long term is kind of a, it's kind of a spook, right? I, I, I thought about it very hard and I decided that I wouldn't want to do that because I think, I think it is better to, because I, I, the, the way I make decisions is what kind of friends am I going to make? Right, and I think that's the dominant question I, I would make. And so I want, like, you know, I'm kind of using this opportunity to convey to my friends that I'm aware of what it would be like to profit from being a demon summoning, outrage farming, you know, amoral person. You can make a lot of money that way. I know how to do it. I'm a marketing guy. I know how to, you know, stir shit, get people mad, and 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 do all that. But you know, at what? Co- in, you might make a bunch of money, but that's like a year of your life or whatever that you have. Uh, it's just, I, I don't think I could do that and not lose respect for myself. And I think my self-respect is the most important thing that I have. And as long as I can respect myself, I can produce content that is grounded in what I believe to be true. And the, I believe that the relationships that I make with people, so the growth here is like slower. I still have a mortgage to pay. I do believe, and this is maybe slightly arrogant to say or whatever, but like I do believe that if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to grow my YouTube subscribers to a point. I'm going to grow my Twitter followers to a point. I'm going to sell enough eBooks to a point where I don't have to worry about my mortgage anymore. You know, I don't, I don't want to be rich. I don't care about like, I don't care about like driving fast cars or wearing super fancy clothes. You know, I, I do want like, you know, cheap, cheap jewelry. That's, that's what I want. You know, this is like 10 bucks, 15 bucks, you know, kind of really... It's not doesn't cost a lot, you know. I I I do want some bling. I'd like to, uh, you know, paint my house, renovate my kitchen, that kind of thing. But I don't want a ton of money. Once I pay off my mortgage, I want to use any resources that come my way to to fund and celebrate other weirdo nerd kids around the world. That's what I really want to do. That's that's my calling in life. I feel like you know I was a lonely, isolated kid. I came onto the internet and I saw possibility. And I saw the opportunity to make friends and I'm making friends and I've done it. You know, I've, I've helped hundreds of people at this point build relationships with each other, right? And make the world a slightly less lonely place. And yeah, you know, any resources that come my way are going to be funneled primarily into that mission. And, you know, like it would probably help if I eat a little bit healthier, sleep a bit better, like all of those. Th- but, you know, it's, it's, it's not it's not a huge priority for me like it's just you get what i'm saying I, I i will try and do my best i don't i don't want like luxury cars i think but uh i don't know we'll see uh i i trust myself and my my friend group right to kind of hold me accountable in in making 
the right decisions for friend the nerd network right the friendly ambitious nerd network i feel like you know i of, i often read about like cults and stuff and i'm like uh, you guys are why are you satisfied with having a bunch of fawning fanboys fangirls whatever like just obsessive cultish followers who worship you and then you have like these these weird sex shit starts happening but like you could have been so much more you know you could have built something that really made a positive impact for the that echoes through the ages that's what i kind of want to do uh i do know that it's a very dramatic thing and and, and you know you have the, the grand vision and then you have the immediate next steps and the immediate next step for me is really it's one person at a time building relationships with individuals coming up with things to say that are interesting and, and writing interesting things that make people feel better make people think about their lives make people you know um, I mean, I'm coming to terms with the fact that I'm I'm currently basically an entertainer right with my tweets and my blog and my view- YouTube videos and my ebooks right i'm making money by being an entertainer like technically that's what i'm doing but you know i believe that like my there's this carl polnack the the head of the boston conservatory music right he had this beautiful bit about how musicians are more like chiropractors for the soul like their emergency their first responders right their emergency you know it's you you help people become whole again right like uh and you think about like Keith, like from Dead Poet Society, that quote that was like, you know, like science, engineering, law, like all these like noble pursuits. They they help us, they help us live. But we what we live for is passion and and art and and like really moving stuff, like things that make us cry and things that make us yearn and things that make us want to be better, right? And I, you know, I I I feel like I have been the benefactor of that process. And when I say that process, I mean like humanity, right? Artists and, and writers and musicians and, and people who have, you know, even even during the Holocaust, like when people were in the concentration camp, some of them were writing music. Can you imagine? Like in the worst, bleakest time of the, the worst shit that's happened to people and people were like, I'm going to write. I'm going to make art. I'm going to share my feelings with people and i think that's that's the most profound thing that you can do with your existence in a sense i think i mean not 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 to put down anybody who's like a technologist or anybody who's you know we all contribute in different ways I, i'm talking about what moves me the most right uh you could be moved by building tools that help people you know have better lives like that's that's also great like there's there's there's, there's no shortage of ways in which we can serve each other right and yeah, I I feel like when I look at the internet and I see a massive library, I see opportunity. You know, I tweeted recently that I think most of the untapped wealth in the world is between people who don't know each other yet. It's in the connections that have not yet been made. It's just think about the best people in your life and imagine if you hadn't met them yet. If you hadn't met them, then think about how there must be ten times, hundred times, thousands of times more of those people out there in the world who are just like all your favorite people, maybe more so in some ways, and you haven't met them yet. And imagine what it would be like if you do meet them. And having met them, imagine what it would be like to unmeet them, right? Like imagine what it would be like to have them taken away from you. Like right now, because right now that's where you are. You know, that's where we are. We are all living in the adjacent possible, right? Like there's there's, there's a whole beautiful reality next door that we can, you know, we can crack open a chink and try and perceive it. And, uh, yeah, you know, I want to help people find each other. And uh, I want to be a, a friend router, in a sense, right? I want to help people find each other. And that will mean going through some painful and stupid and difficult bullshit when people don't understand what I'm trying to do or they think that, you know, they understandably look at me and I remind them of, like, opportunistic grifters and they think that, you know, if it looks like a grift, it must be a grift. So, you know... <laughs> Uh yeah, time time will tell, right? Like there's 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 no real way of proving what you are except by continuing to be it over a long period of time. So I'm gonna do that. And uh yeah, we are approaching an hour. I would like to end this now. Um Thank you for hanging out. You know, this is almost an hour. It's like and I got to talk about one of my favorite things, which is the internet that we are through which we are currently conversing, right? 
I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you, so it's a parasocial relationship. But if you reply in the comments, I will reply back as much as I can uh, until I have the happy problem of too many people to reply to, which may or may not happen. You know, maybe I have delusions of grandeur. But to me, it's just math, right? It's just numbers. It's just if you keep doing the thing, there's, there's too many people in the world for something that is w- effortfully executed that people don't notice. Like, it just, you just need to keep doing it and people notice. It, it, it happened on my Twitter, right? So now I have like 23,000 people following me on Twitter. So what happened on Twitter is going to happen on YouTube as well. And I look forward to that. I look forward to the opportunities that I do not even perceive right now that will come to me when I have crossed those thresholds. And more than that, I look forward to hearing from people who seeing me do it, seeing me do my thing, will realize that they can do their own thing, whatever their thing is, right? That's the real, that's the real move. Because when, you know, there's a quote that's something like, what should you do with your life? You should do what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So let's end it there. And uh, nice chatting. Let me know what you think in the comments. Done.